Okay, we're going to get started. To get started. Um, all right. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. So you're entering the Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this first of our Feb February is Love Sustainable Chemistry series. Um, my name is Cecilia Wandiga. I am Executive Director of the Center for Science and Technology Innovations. Uh, today, we're going to have three parts to this webinar. Uh, normally, um, most of you have been seeing me doing the talking, and we thought it's important for you to interact with, as a public, with the chemists who are here with us and form part of CSDI. So um, the first part, uh, you will hear a presentation by Dr. Eno Kosoro, and then we'll have a presentation, video presentation from our partners at uh, Lowell Center uh, uh, in Ma University of Massachusetts, and they will present on the definition of sustainable chemistry. And from there, we'll proceed to our partners at QC University. We have Dr. Kennedy Olale and Dr. Felix Ogutu, and uh, they will go through uh, the use talks part, which is the last part of this webinar. And what we're hoping with this is to not only create awareness, but um, the, this is an invite to have discussions on, we know most of these discussions tend to be limited to the laboratory or to specialty workshops, and we're trying to open this up to a broader audience. And with that, I'll uh, get ready to transfer over to Enoch so that he can then go through and explain to you the different components, not only about CSDI, but what we're hoping to achieve. Thank you. This meeting, uh, I'm going to present a, a small presentation on the role of CSTI on building awareness on need for testing of such as chemists in the environment. My name is uh, Andoro. I'm part of him with uh, science, technology, and education. So with that uh, small introduction, I would like to use what Center for Science and Technology Innovation that is in uh, initial of CSTI. You get that uh, CSTI is a UNESCO Associate Center that's registered as a trustee under the Kenya Trust Act, Chapter 167. The center is based at the Kenya Academy of Sciences and it began its operation in 1998. The, main, uh, uh, the founders of this uh, center realized that there is a gap between the, the people and the science, and therefore they came up with a, a center that they can be able to disseminate the, info, the, info, the scientific information scientific information to the people, which people can be able to understand. This is simple because they realize that um, science of the first century is progressing faster than uh, the lay person can be able to absorb. <coughs> so the mission for CSDI uh, is to improving the life through science, technology, and innovation. And this one we do by uh, interacting with the local community and all the stakeholders so that we can be able to disseminate the science, the technology, and innovation to the local and the international community at large. We have uh, CSDI uh, aims, which, is the, which are the aims for the center. Number one aim is to promote innovation in science teaching 
at the secondary and tertiary education level through the incorporation of new trends in science. And this one, we have, this aim we have done by getting in new kids that we can be able to help science students in the secondary schools to understand science in the best way by using these new kits. We have the, the chemistry kits, we have the physics kits, where we go to the sci uh, high school students to teach them on chemistry using the, the kits that are cheaper and easy to be used. The second uh, aim is to uh, enhance the transfer of science and technology research research, research research to distress the community for economic development. Another one is to promote constructive linkage between science and industry for the enhancement of economic development. The other aim is to promote the effective use of science and technology in the food production process then is to facilitate, facilitate initiatives to achieve greater efficiency through adoption of good uh, scientific mechanisms. Uh, we have more aims uh, of the center is to promote the use of information and communication te technologies in the transfer of science and, te and technology. Another aim is to collaborate with uh, other centers with similar objectives and aims. Another aim of the center is to act as a broker or to a linkage uh, of knowledge and skills between the researcher or research institute and end user, including policymakers. Uh, our last aim is to perform any other duties, furthering the development, promotion, and dissemination of science. The, 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 in, 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 in furthering our aims and objectives and the mission of the, the center, we are creating awareness. This is the, in which is the first step in ongoing effort towards sustainable chemistry across all industries. We are examining such as chem, uh, chemicals in electronic and the building materials. And in today's session, focus on marketing electronic, on electronics, and next week we shall examine building materials. The communal learning channel is statistical analysis, and at the end of, we shall use the user talks um, a software, which is a free Excel tool to create, created by UNEP, so that it can be able to help us to understand the toxicity of different um, elements in the environment. So first of all, we need to understand what are hazardous chemicals. You get that hazardous chemicals are environmental hazard, is a substance or a state or event in which that has a potential to threaten the surrounding or environment or adversely affect people's health. And these include pollution and natural disasters, such as storm and earthquakes. Chemical assets are mainly caused by characteristics of chemical substances that may cause explosions, fires, or corrosion, or emit poisonous gases or but, uh, mini particles. And you get that these uh, chemical assets uh, most of the time, the, these substances react negatively when exposed to or mixed with other materials or chemical substances. For instance, as pesto particles are issued first in the atmosphere when moved, and therefore it, it's an hazard to that uh, in, in environment where it has been dispersed to. We have um, uh, chemical hazards in, uh, in, uh, in, 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 in our environment. For example, we have mercury. Uh, you get mercury most of the time. It's used in uh, LCD screens and monitors, uh, in our TV switches, in laptop screens, and in fluorescent bulbs. 
this macule that uh, is used generally in most of our daily uh, uh, equipment and apparatus that we use, you get that if you are exposed more to macule, uh, most of the time you get that uh, there are health hazards that are caused by this macule. And in most cases, you get that there is growth of the peripheral fissures, uh, pins and needles in which feeding usually in the hands, feet, and around the mouth. It, it also uh, leads to lack of coordination of movement and muscle weaknesses. And um, this machine has been associated as being cancerous, and therefore it has been shown, such as shown, that uh, machine uh, can cause cancer. We have other, other, other such as chemicals in the environment. We have cadmium. Cadmium is mostly used in uh, rechargeable batteries, in uh, electroplanting coatings, solar cells, plastic stabilizers, and plastic pigments. The health hazard of this cadmium, cadmium is a metal, uh, and heavy metal, it's, it causes through like, symptoms which are like chills, fever, and muscle pains. Uh, in sometimes the long-term exposure to small quantities can cause hidden failure, phone and lung diseases. Another hazardous chemical that I would like to discuss about is lead. Lead um, causes, uh, trans uh, it's used in transmitters, receivers, electric voltage sensors, plastic dyes, and solder rings. In most of the time when you're exposed to lead, it's a neurotoxin, it reduces the IQ, uh, impended brain and nervous system problem, and it increases the risk of high blood pressure and kidney damage. How do we expose ourselves to these um, uh, uh, such as chemical substances? Most of the time we inhale if you are in um, an environment that has been um, um, that has been um, polluted with this of substance. For example, if you go to um, an industry that is producing cadmium, that's uh, using cadmium or using mercury in their production of different, um, for example, those ones producing the, the, the screens of our TV. Sometimes you may inhale this chemical substance. So another form in which we can be able to get the exposure to this chemical substance through absorption, injection, and ingestion. If you eat something that has been contaminated with, uh, with this chemical substance, so therefore you can be able to be exposed to this chemical substance. You get that um, uh, most of uh, developing countries and underdeveloped countries, they don't have enough data or enough information on these th the chemical substances or that are suggest in their environment. And therefore, they have challenges in uh, getting this data. And once you don't have enough data in, uh, in, 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 of these chemical substances, it becomes also very hard for you to make laws that are ascertained to these chemical substances because you don't have enough data to enable you to make these uh, laws. So they, you get that they have different challenges that are facing to this testing of this chemical substance. Number one challenge that we have seen is no skills in material testings. No, most of the time you get that we don't have skills in testing these chemical substances. Another uh, problem that we have, we have encountered is um, there is no, there's lack of equipment, uh, the equipment that can be able to test these 
uh, 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 such as substances, and most of the time you don't have, if you have uh, an equipment, the technician who are working to use this equipment or maintain this um, uh, equipment are not available. So I've said about the, 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 the data uh, on uh, the toxic chemicals in the environment is not enough. And therefore, it's, it's not possible for policy formulators to make policies concerning to this uh, chemical substances because they don't have this uh, data on, 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 on the hazardous chemicals in the environment. So uh, CSTI I want to would like to act as a, a link between the industry, the policy formulators, and all the communities so that we can be able to have an open lab that we can be able to test for these uh, chemicals and therefore we can be able to cross the we, we, we can be able to act as a linkage between now the data where we can be able to get the data and this data can be, be able to be used by different people, policy formulators, so that we can be able to have uh, enough information and we can be able to have good policies. So we intend to have a specialized equipment for testing chemicals in the environment, in the indoor environment, that's in, within the building and infrastructures and out uh, environment. We need to have, once we have the open laboratory, we can be able to um, have a training on different people so that we can be able to have capacity on the technicians who can be able to use this sophisticated equipment to test different, uh, uh, different uh, such as uh, chemicals in our environment. So we intend to have train on operation, troubleshooting, and simple maintenance of this equipment. We intend to train fresh graduates on industrial requirements. We will be able to, you get that most of the uh, fresh graduates are not able to have that industrial training, and therefore we intend to train them on the industrial requirements. We are going, we intend to test for toxic chemicals to SME, at a minimum cost, a cost that can be able to just only maintain the instruments and train SME on green chemistry well, they can be able to reduce the chemicals, chemicals that are being emitted to the environment. You get that these chemicals most of the time are being emitted from our production system. So if we train the SME on the green chemistry well, they would be able to reduce the the uh, the, the, the effluents, the the hazardous chemicals that are being released to the environment on the input where the the, the, the input that they're getting into the factory, they will be able to reduce the chemicals and therefore we will be able to reduce hazardous chemicals to the to the environment. So in this way, we a green chemistry. Green chemistry is that uh, I would like to uh, to define what's green chemistry. The green chemistry is the design of chemical product and process that reduce or eliminate the use or generation of hazardous substances. The green chemistry applies across the life cycle of a chemical product, including its design, where you are designing the best way possible that we can be able to reduce the hazard, uh, the hazard, uh, hazard chemicals released to the environment, the manufacture itself, the use and the ultimate disposal, if any, the ultimate disposal of the end product so that we can be able to have a reduced or minimal or no chemical that's being emitted to the environment. Uh, you get that the green chemistry prevents pollution at the molecular level. That means that at the reception level where you are signing your, 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 your manufacturing, you are able to sign a, 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 a manufacture process that's able to use good input 
and we are able to reduce the or reduce or minimize or at all we don't get any hazardous chemical substance emitted to the environment. And together, it's a philosophy that applies to all areas of chemistry, not a discipline of chemistry. Uh, you get that green chemistry applies innovative scientific solutions to real world environmental problems. The result in source, source reduction, it starts in so, source reduction because it prevents the generation of pollution. You get that other, other methods of chemistry, you get that we are trying to uh, look on the means of cleaning the acidus, like remediating the acidus chemicals that we have emitted to the environment. But to get for this green chemistry, we are going to the source and reducing the, the <coughs> pollution, the chemical acid that we are emitting to the environment. It reduces the negative impacts of chemical products and processes on human health and the environment. And this green chemistry lessens and sometimes eliminates hazard from existing products and processes. And in this green chemistry, it designs chemical products and processes to reduce their intrinsic hazards. So, how does uh, green chemistry differ from cleaning up the pollution? As I've said, in green chemistry, we uh, we clean the the stock feed that we the stock we ensure that the stock feed that we put into the production is clean, and therefore the the hazards are not emitted to the to the environment. Why do you get that? The, cleaning up the pollution, it's like a remediation where it involves treating the waste streams that you have put the environment so that we can be able to reduce now the pollution that we have put to the environment. So, you get that if a technology reduces or eliminates the aside as chemicals used to clean up environmental contaminants, this technology will qualify as a green technology. So we have principles that guide uh, the green chemistry. There are 12 in, uh, in number, and these principles are like you prevent the waste, you maximize atom economy, you design less hazardous chemical synthesis, you design several chemicals and products, you use several solvents and reaction condition, you increase energy efficiency, you use renewable feedstocks, you avoid chemical derivatives, you use catalysts, not stoichiometric reagents, design a chemical and product to degrade after use. So the chemicals that are, you get that the chemical that we, you use and design can be able to degrade in the environment. And that way it qualifies to that chemical to be a green chemical. You analyze in real time to prevent pollution. So every time in green chemistry there's zero pollution or very minimal pollution. So you have to make sure that there is no pollution to the environment. So in our next is uh, sustainable chemistry. You get that um, now we are moving now from now the green chemistry to sustainable chemistry in which now the green chemistry we process we take it to the industry you get that sustainable chemistry is an international industrial process that creates better products and results in a fewer pollution and are profitable so the greener chemistry that we we, we move now from greener chemistry, we go to sustainable chemistry, where we apply this innovation that we have done in sustainable in green chemistry to the industrial scale, and it should be sustain, uh, uh, sustainable and with less pollution and profitable.
So these are the conditions that we do in sustainable uh, chemistry. Uh, the human health must be uh, adhered to that we, we must have human health is number one priority, therefore reducing the, the, the pollution completely and therefore the human health will be enhanced. The second one is ecological health. That's our environment should be very ecological. Education should be continual. We have innovation. We have the secular economy, expansory regulation, and social justice. So those are the main components in green chemistry. With that, I want to say thank you for listening to me, and I hand over the meeting to Cecilia. Thank you for that, Enoch. Um, a really good overview. Uh, one thing I would just like to uh, clarify for uh, non-chemists, both green chemistry and sustainable chemistry can be used at an industrial scale um, or at a laboratory scale. Uh, one, what we're trying to do with the green, as Enoch presented, is to design, like they say, design the night. So the, we have chemicals that have a benign or non-negative impact in health and environment. And then we're looking at sustainable chemistry. So what you like to do is then is bring in more evaluation on the social aspects of it. So uh, not just the technical side, looking at the technical formulation, but now we can Hi everyone, thanks for having me and for the opportunity to engage with you about this work. My name is Monica and I'm a postdoc researcher at UMass Lowell working at the Sustainable Chemistry Catalyst, which is housed within the Lowell Center for Sustainable Production at the University of Massachusetts, Lowell. In addition to the Sustainable Chemistry Catalyst, this project is co-led with Beyond Benign, a green chemistry education nonprofit. So this idea of defining sustainable chemistry is not new, and over the last few decades, several other groups and agencies have put out their own vision statements, definitions, and principles, but the impetus for this project came out with the passing of the United States Sustainable Chemistry R&D Act with the 2021 National Defense Authorization Act, which mandates that the U.S. Office of Science and Technology Policy develop a consensus definition of sustainable chemistry, as stated in their words, to identify research questions and priorities to promote transformational progress in improving the sustainability of the chemical sciences. So as this act was being passed, we at the Sustainable Chemistry Catalyst and Beyond Benign reached out to our network of experts in this area to start conversations around sustainable chemistry, which transformed into a more permanent project with funding from the New York Community Trust, a grant-making foundation with an investment portfolio focused on the environment, which includes a focus on reducing chemical exposures. The overall goal of the project was to create a definition and set of criteria for use by decision makers across different sectors, as well as for use in educational settings. This project involved the creation of an expert committee we call ECOSCHEM for short, and we strive for representation across sectors and experiences. This, com this committee includes Cecilia Wandiga, who invited me to present here today. We held five full committee meetings with many smaller subcommittee meetings in between to work on specific components of the project, like the definition, criteria, and preamble, but also held several subcommittee meetings that reviewed environmental and social justice principles to discuss how to reference and incorporate those into the work. As uh, the Office of Science and Technology Policy is working on a consensus definition, we also strive for consensus within ECOSCHEM, using this question here at the bottom as a through line in meetings to drive discussion. Can you live with the preamble definition and criteria as developed and speak of it positively? The definition that we arrived at originated from a review of 44 sources that contain definitions of either sustainable chemistry, green and sustainable chemistry, safe and sustainable by design, as there was no one definition that stood out for us to adopt, 
we worked off of our collective experience and the previous definitions identified to refine a new one. What you see here reads, sustainable chemistry is the development and application of chemicals, chemical processes, and products that benefit current and future generations without harmful impacts to humans or ecosystems. The definition was created to be both aspirational as well as actionable. Many conversations occurred in the expert committee meetings as to how to balance wording that clearly conveys what sustainable chemistry should be while also being practical. The definition was also intended to be succinct so that one would hopefully be able to recite it from memory. And while the definition should be able to stand alone, it should also be looked at in the context of a set of criteria that provide clarification as to what sustainable chemistry means in practice. The criteria were developed with a review of the literature combined with experience, again, from the expert committee. Criteria were grouped into overarching criteria categories you see here around the definition, with the first two categories on top, equity and justice and transparency, being about the processes surrounding how chemicals, materials, processes, products, and services are made or carried out, while the last three criteria categories, health and safety impacts, climate and ecosystem impacts, and circularity, being more about the actual life cycles of chemicals and products and their impacts. On the left, each criteria category is articulated further, with each one slightly abbreviated for the purpose of this meeting and just getting the main ideas across. As you'll see that the goal, you'll see here that the goal for these criteria was to use language that is broad enough to capture key aspects that would need to be fulfilled while not being so specific as to be metrics, which would need to be specified in subsequent work depending on the sector or field. So the first, the first criteria category is equity and justice with focus on the engagement and protection of marginalized communities and the prioritization of products that either remediate past harms or strengthen local economies. The second category is transparency, which is about information disclosure, verification of sustainability claims, and having chain of custody information. The third category is health and safety impacts, which emphasizes that the materials used to make products, as well as the products themselves and their breakdown products and byproducts, should be non-hazardous and not persist or bioaccumulate. The fourth category is climate and ecosystem impacts, and this category is meant to focus on the resources and energy used to make and transport products with the intention for minimizing their impact on climate and ecosystems. And the fifth category is circularity, and the points here focus on the efficient design of chemicals, materials, processes, products, and services to reduce waste and impact on the environment. Overall, the idea is that a chemical material process product or service would need to meet all of these five criteria categories and the bullets in order to be called as having utilized or been made with sustainable chemistry so that there's no cherry picking or trade-offs. In the full document, you'll see these written out more fully and accompanied by footnotes that expand upon the meaning of certain words or phrases, also accompanied by a preamble in the beginning that provides further context for this work. I've sent Cecilia a link that she can share with you so that you'll be able to read it in full if you're interested. And I think that I, that link is at the, um, at the end of this presentation. There are of course, a lot of challenges in undertaking this work. The main one being, well, what do these criteria mean in practice? The scope of this project was to create the language that everyone could generally agree upon with the idea that the criteria will need to be further clarified and indicators or metrics developed in order to measure fulfillment of the criteria or progress towards them. We've also heard that writing up case studies to show sustainable, sustainable chemistry in practice um, would be helpful. And it sounds like you're gonna undertake or at least talk about some of um, what sustainable chemistry could mean in the context of the e-waste uh, industry today. The second point is related in that some of the criteria may be more straightforward than others. 
Um, it was really important to, in this project to acknowledge that the environmental and social impacts related to chemistry practices are extremely important and to put those into their criteria. However, this is of course more challenging um, to think about in terms of equity and justice for what, for instance, engagement with communities looks like, what strengthening local economies looks like, um, but at least in the expert committee uh, meetings, and overall, this was deemed as really important to bring in and to be worked on in the future and integrated. And this last point, again, is pointing out a challenge of putting the criteria in practice, acknowledging that not all products are made the same and that some companies may just play a very small role in the value chain of a product. So in that case, would all criteria apply for this situation? Further work needs to be done to really develop the system for what the criteria look like in practice, which might look like a tiered system to allow for progress, something like LEED certification for buildings, a gold, silver, platinum approach, um, but it would have to be done in a way where uh, trade-offs would be minimized. So anyone who engages with this work will think about it from the perspective of where they are as a manufacturer, transporter, retailer, consumer, recycler, educator, or from a place of experiencing negative impacts from any part of the life cycle or chemicals or products. Part of this work is really getting people to think about the life cycles of chemicals and products and the impacts that they have on people or the environment or workers. So thinking through case examples like what you are all doing today is really useful, as well as what would need to change about those examples in order for it to be more sustainable. For many of those case examples that directly impact your lives or are important to your work, you also have the knowledge to think through what's possible for making change in certain areas. For instance, what would engagement with communities on product design look like? Or what do consumers think about in terms of product transparency? Or what are the barriers um, for producers in making um, products more transparent? And then this last point is that discussion is just really important. So here in this meeting and in your networks, and we hope that this definition and criteria can be used, applied in different contexts and built on top of. So here in the US, um, the full document that you will have access to with the preamble definition and criteria was submitted to the Office of Science and Technology Policy last month. Um, and they are considering it in shaping the consensus definition that they will put out, um, perhaps in March sometime or soon after. So we'll have to see how that definition differs from this one that we created here. The next steps for us on the project team is to share this work more broadly. We'll be holding a webinar on March 1st to talk about the process and meaning of the definition and criteria with Cecilia here on the panel. And we'll also be putting out a blog and journal article. We're also discussing a next phase of this project to build um, on top of, and that would be more focused on, on building out the criteria and uh, metrics and indicators a bit more. And I just wanted to leave with some quotes from the expert committee. It was overall challenging to create a definition and criteria that uh, people from different sectors um, could agree upon the industry, the nonprofit sector, academia, investment, etc. Um, it's certainly not perfect, but as Tom Welton here says, the hope is that this work will be useful and can also be developed out further. And from Martin Wolf, that having clear goals is essential, and adding on here from general sentiments of the expert committee, especially in ways that are really protective of people and the environment and that doesn't allow for greenwashing or unacceptable trade-offs. So I'm gonna stop here and hopefully this provides some food for thought and discussion. Here's my email if you need to reach out uh, to me or Cecilia can also reach out with any questions that you might have. This is the website for the Sustainable Chemistry Catalyst, um, also the website for Beyond Benign, if you're interested in exploring those. And then the link to the full document is here below. Thank you.
And we'd really like to thank uh, Monica um, for the um, presentation. Uh, sorry, I'm catching. Uh, we thank Monica for participating with us, and uh, what we she wasn't if she really wanted to be able to present live. Uh, of course, the time difference uh, is an issue, but on the March 1st webinar, uh, that's a chance, and we'll distribute the link for everybody so that you can join and participate, and that will be a chance to engage with the ECOSCAM committee. Uh, again, that's the Beyond the Night Network at Yale and the Lowell Center uh, for Sustainable Production uh, at University of Massachusetts. And with those two, the, and we also have a third partner uh, unable to participate today, which is the International Sustainable Collaborative, International Sustainable Chemistry Collaborative Center, uh, and in, from, which is the chemicals unit of GIZ. Uh, they will be joining in next Thursday when we're discussing building materials. So you'll be able to interact with uh, the, those set of our partners at that time. What we're trying to do, as Monica said, is now discuss case studies. So when we're looking at electronic waste, which means your cell phone, your laptop, your light bulbs, there this issue of coming up with social justice and trade-offs. We are promoting circular economy, which is a good thing because we want to reuse the materials, but we also have to be cognizant that the materials sometimes are not in a position or not good for reuse. So that's where you heard Enoch explaining about green chemistry, is um, if we can get the lead, the mercury, and the cadmium out of these electronic products, then you, whether you're taking those electronic products are being re reused and, and de disassembled at a center like WEEE uh, Center here in Nairobi, which has ISO standards, or whether you have uh, informal settlements and waste pickers and people are working with that machinery and equipment, you don't have to worry that those who are working in informal settlements are at a high, very high risk of health damage because they don't have the high-end equipment needed to prevent the type of damage that occurs when you're exposed to these types of chemicals we're mentioning. And so what we're going to do, uh, a, a little more delving into chemistry, sorry for those who are not chemists, and now I'll switch to Kennedy Olale, Dr. Kennedy Olale from uh, KC University. And what we did was we went through uh, the Use Talk software, it's a free tool. We'll also circulate the instructions when, along with this video. And we did sort of a preliminary analysis for lead, mercury, and cadmium. He's just going to focus on the mercury. And we're going to go through and show you the implications so that you can better understand what we mean when we say that there's health implications and, and issues to consider. Kennedy, are you ready? Yeah, uh, I think I'll do a bit of introduction to Dr. Olale. Uh, okay. Dr. Lali is, an, is an analytical chemistry. Um, that's his background, and uh, of course, he's my colleague at KC University. And so he does delve into issues to do with um, toxicity, um, environmental um, uh, particulates, or even soil samples, where he's an expert in chemical informatics. So Dr. Lali's uh, um, area of expertise was sort of um, much more rich to uh, what you were, what the, the data that was provided. So when we look at the data on a, on a, on a general um, look, uh, then we observe that there, um, there's quite a big amount of data, but it was mostly from a continental uh, data of various um, parameters. So we we're trying to see how we can translate that information into something that somebody can actually look at and actually be able to understand. So I did give it to Dr. Lale. Um, to try and make sense out of it so that now when we are presenting on this forum, then it actually starts making a little bit of sense from that very data that we got from uh, new stocks, basically. So, uh, Dr. Lale, you can start. Thank you. 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 Thank
And, and Hezron, before he starts, can you introduce yourself too? Okay, sorry, sorry, sorry for not introducing myself. I had assumed that everyone knows who I am, uh, which is which is very bad. So my, my name is Dr. Dr. Hezron Ogutu. Um, I'm a chemist by training. I did I studied industrial chemistry um, at University of Nairobi before proceeding for masters, uh, um, masters and PhD uh, at Stanford University, both of them in South Africa. So since then, I've been a member of uh, CSTI, where we collaborate with the director, and of course members, and we were introduced to this uh, use talk um, uh, initially through a meeting that went to in, um, uh, in, ICRAF, in, in ICRAF in Nairobi. So after that, we, we, we tried to explore what, what it is about and try and learn more. So that's when now I started to co-op some of my members uh, in, in my university so that we can actually be able to work together and see. Um, is it something that we can actually incorporate in our university as a sustainable chemistry objective? So um, I think that is it. I'll let Dr. Lale to, uh, to continue. Or I'll hand it over back to you, uh, Cecilia. That's good. Uh, Dr. Lale, can you continue? Thank you so much. We're not hearing you. Mute. Okay. Now we looked at the data that was provided from the use talks, and uh, we were trying to see what kind of information we are able to extract from it. And if you look at the screen, uh, we picked some of the parameters that were, sorry, I'm just setting up something here. Okay. If you look at the screen, we were able just to, to uh, extract some, some, some information that was given from that uh, Excel sheet. And we wanted to have it easier way in which uh, we are able to to, to visualize to visualize and uh, make sense out of the uh, analysis that have already been done. Now the data that was presented there, we only picked the the, the, the key components, especially uh, the ones that were showing some significant levels in terms of uh, uh, the concentrations that we were able to have. And if you see the the Excel that we are, I mean, the, the PowerPoint that we have here, it's only showing some selected. I didn't, we didn't pick all of them because some of the parameters that are here were not, we were not able to, they were below the 0, 0.00 limit that we had here. So even if you look at the midpoint, which is just used to, to, to estimate the potential for the adverse health effect, uh, you can see the emissions to the household for these three elements that were there, mercury, cadmium, and lead. And uh, uh, here we compared and uh, just checked the overall trend in terms of the concentrations of, uh, of these chemicals at different levels. Now, the data that we are having is a continental data, so this is the whole general outlook of, uh, of the data that is, uh, is, is given. Now, there is a midpoint, uh, which is actually used to, to estimate the potential for the adverse effect, adverse effect uh, from these emissions, whether it is coming from indoor, whether it is coming from industrial indoor, urban air, emission to continental agricultural soil, then you are able to see the values. Now, when you, you go to the end point, which is a, an estimate that is used for now the actual occurrence of the adverse health effect, you are again able to see how the emission from the continental agricultural soil is. Uh, sorry, I don't know if this is visible. Oh, here, if you look at this column that I'm showing on this side, you are able to see the concentration of mercury. That where we have the emission from the continental agricultural soil, then the mercury levels was higher than all these other 
uh, household, industrial, or, or uh, urban air pollution. So this endpoint that actually uh, measures or estimates the actual occurrence of the adverse health effect is usually expressed in DLYs, what we call the disability adjusted uh, uh, life years, per unit mass of the emitted or what is released. So the higher the values that we have on this side, the higher these values, then the greater the potential for the adverse health effect. So again, if you look across here, it is in, you can see uh, the emissions, whether the, the, the adverse health effect here we are talking about is either cancer or non-cancer, and uh, that is how it was provided in the data that we had there. So we are just looking at whether they, they are able to show the potential or not. Then again, in the data there was also what we're calling the midpoint. Uh, this midpoint, uh, what, what we are calling the midpoint ecotoxicity characterization factor, is also used to estimate the potential ecological impact which is associated with the exposure of these substances. Now we are here we are talking about the lead, the mercury, and uh, and, uh, and the cadmium, but in this midpoint exosity, uh, uh, eco ecotoxicity characterization, it was led that, I mean, this is a, this is a, sorry, something we are not seeing. Now, you can see from this, we are having more, my screen is paused, I don't know why. Is it still able to say? We're, we're okay. seeing it, but we, we're not seeing a change of screen. We're so we we, we also point. again, all these midpoint ecotoxicity values with all the three elements, and you are able to just to see which one is uh, having higher levels, because these are just the parameters that you're using in terms of uh, assessing the potential environmental impact that is associated with the emissions of those three compounds that we had, or the three uh, chemical components that we had there. Uh, we also looked at this in terms of the endpoint, the midpoint. Now the endpoint is just used to measure the potential environmental impact. In this case, the one that we have for the mercury, cadmium, and also lead. And comparing these values in terms of what is permitted, what is permitted in aquatic systems, and here we have the fresh water, uh, the one that is coming from industrial use, all the way up to the emission that is coming from agricultural sites. So we, we, we also analyzed what was given as fate factor uh, in the data as was provided. Kennedy, and, uh, one second. Uh, is, uh, the fate factors is just used to measure, uh, it's a measure of the mass of that substance that is expected to be in the environment. Uh, and it is the one that we are using to quantify how much, in terms of the per unit mass, what has been emitted in the environment. So, you are able to see? The screen is... Okay. No, we, we the phase factor, see, and then we, we also see. checked on the intake fraction. We're not seeing the fake factor. The intake screen. fraction, uh, which is just a measure of the amount of pollutant that is taken by the humans per unit mass of the emitted to the environment. So the data as given in the output is, is a, oh, you're not seeing the fit factor. Why is it telling me that my name is frozen? Try, try just doing the way Ed did where he, instead of Are maximizing, we're still only seeing the, so, the sorry initial for that, I'm told my screen has resumed share, sorry. Yeah. Is it is it now okay? Yeah. It's okay this way. Yes. yes. Okay, sorry, we, we, we sorry I was told my screen was not sharing. Sorry for that. So we looked at the end point, we looked at now the phase factor which just measures the, the mass of that substance that is expected to be in the environment and we calculated just based on the data that was provided and you can see the emission that was coming from in all this data, if you look at the trend, there is a lot of emission that is coming from continental agricultural soil. Be it uh, whether you are measuring the endpoint because of the ecotoxicity, whether you are measuring the midpoint, which that shows the potential, then 
the emission that was coming from agricultural soil was evident that uh, all of these elements were, were present in all of them. So uh, the third part is the one that I was finishing up with that also we, were, we, were, we were also able to see it also being present in the emission that is coming from agricultural soil. Now, uh, you look at the intake fraction, what is defined as the intake fraction, uh, just the amount of pollutant that is taken by humans per unit mass of the emitter. Uh, we were looking, the data as provided for had the emission that was coming from the household indoor pollution and the emissions that are coming from agricultural continental soil. Now, some were not, uh, they were so low because this is the amount of the pollutant that is actually taken up by humans, by humans uh, per unit mass. Now, you look at it, these are below ground, above ground, but uh, what was uh, uh, interesting here is to look at the emission from the continental rural air. The above ground pollution, here you will be able to see that there is an uptake of mercury. Again, here for the above ground, as well as urban air, and also here the above ground, indoor air, also above ground here, we are able to find it. Uh, the human health effect factor, there was also data that was provided on the human health effect factor, which just estimates the potential human health impact that is associated with the exposure for this. So we, we had the health effects, the cancer or non-cancer, uh, where it is through inhalation, the first part here is through inhalation, and the second part here is in, in digestion. Yes, and you are able to see that here the mercury level is slightly higher, the cases that are reported per kilogram of the intake. And again here, the cases of mercury is there. Now, uh, lastly, what was provided was what is called the eco-exposure factor, which measures the potential exposure of an ecosystem to the either mercury or lead that we had in a typical and is usually the monitor lens. But it is the one that is going to show us the potential exposure limit of uh, the said compound. So here, the, the, the said contaminant. So here we are talking about the, the, the two contaminants, the, the cadmium and also the mercury here showing some higher levels. And again, if you look at uh, what we're referring to as eco-effect factor, which is also based on the toxicity of those substances in to the receiving environment, uh, in this case, globally, we, because this data was more of continental, we find it is the mercury and also the cadmium that is having, uh, showing that kind of uh, large scale exposure pattern. Uh, we only had this to explore from the data, and uh, we left out the values that were not going to show some any significance because they were a bit low and only picked on uh, the parameters that we thought would be able to make sense. So I, 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 I say thank you, and I don't think there is more on this, but uh, it's, a, it's a very good way of uh, all these are calculated, and I think the software does the calculation for these values, and then it gives you just the output in an Excel, and then you are now able to see from there an uh, easier way of visualizing how the data looks like. Otherwise, thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, this, again, is an introduction, uh, and the interpretation we will... Oops. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Can't hear you. How about now? Yeah, that is it from us. Can you hear me now? Okay, just one second. You're not hearing me? Okay, so still as you to, um, I don't know if people can hear me. Yeah, so one of the things that we um, have uh, as we were, can you hear me? Yes. 
Can you hear me? So, one of the things is that because we got the data, and in most cases, if you have data, uh, data by itself does not really always give the, the, the full picture unless you have the background story. So while we know where the data is from, we can also say some of the effects that it is trying to correlate. We still, you know, we still don't know um, what is the background, where was the, what, what was the nature of, of collection, what were the, the, the interest of the, individ, uh, the various individuals. If we had that, then now we can actually take the data and actually be able to um, analyze it much further to see where the correlations are, so that now we can actually be able to say, okay, this data here is actually um, a cause or has, uh, has got an effect that, it has, that is bringing from this particular end, uh, from a particular end. So that, that means that, that, that means that the, now the data in itself, we can just be able to analyze it as, 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 um, as, as just as, a, as normal data that is coming to you. But if you have the, the background story, we know where the data was collected from, we know what was the interest, like, okay, this is why, the, this is where the, the mercury, the collector says, which ones specifically, um, what, what, what exactly do they, are they looking for? From that aspect, then we can actually be able to even find more information so that now this program here can actually be extended to have even a wider region specific. Yeah, so once it's uh, region specific and also to be able to be used as a predictive tool. Because that now is, is, is very important because you can say, okay, this, at this region we are, because of the amount of mercury or lead or even uh, any other pollutant, this is the region whereby the cancer uh, cases are going to rise. So they're going to spike because we can actually be able to see from the data that we have that this is what's going on. So those are the, the, the stories that we, we felt were missing from the data. But then we understand because this is just the data that was that we received and that's why we could yeah, that we could actually be able to, to see. So that's what I wanted to add. Thank you. And uh, uh, am I audible now? Can you can you hear me? Okay. So uh, one of the, so adding to what you said is that with uh, what we're going to be doing with ECRAF and other centers, this is not just going to be uh, within CSDI or within Kenya, is looking at soil samples and looking at plant samples. So uh, what Eco, Eco Use Talks allows us to do, just like um, uh, Hezron and Kennedy have said, is be able to take the soil readings of local samples and then see input that into the software and see if those readings differ from these regional parameters which have been uh, adjusted for Africa but you know that that doesn't mean that they're adjusted for East Africa doesn't mean they're adjusted for Kenya doesn't mean that they're adjusted for different countries within Kenya so what we need to do is now uh, when you heard uh, and off at the beginning saying there's a need for a massive amount of testing, that massive amount of testing pertains to that massive amount of testing will pertain to being able to collect these samples and analyze them. So with that, um, I know we have two uh, participants who are also members of our team. We'd like to welcome Nancy and Brian uh, to give comments or feedback uh, has, in terms of has this been uh, adequate. Uh, Brian, we'll start with you in terms of as a graduate, a recent graduate of chemistry, and then we'll go to Nancy since you don't have a chemistry background and give some feedback. Brian, you can go ahead. Uh, can you hear me? Brian, please. Uh, can you hear me? Put on your video. Please put, put on your video. Uh.
Thank you. Very All right. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, Go ahead, Brian. All right. Uh, so, uh, in terms of the presentation, uh, in terms of the uh, use talks, uh, I found it that uh, it's quite uh, informative in a way. Um, however, for me personally, I think I'll have to uh, take more time, and uh, you know, in terms of practicing on how to use it. Yeah, that's it for me. Yeah. And what about in terms of based on what you learned at the university you went to, JQuat? Went to JQuat, right? Yes, yes. Uh, how do you feel? Because one of the things I like to assess is uh, whether or not students feel the level of training they're getting is useful uh, in terms of being able to take the chemistry and be in terms of employment in industry. Uh, being able to work on different projects. And this is not a limitation on JQuad, it would be any university, so because the curricula in terms of basic requirements are pretty much the same. We're just trying to get your reaction as a recent graduate. Uh, sorry, uh, can you repeat your question? So, your perspective as a recent graduate, because we hear a lot of complaints from graduates like yourself that the current type of curriculum that's taught any university, and you're from JQuad, but any university, whether it be University of Nairobi, TUK, TC University, we're hearing students say that when you graduate, you're put into situations that are not familiar in terms of the analysis. So if you had to use this forum to give feedback, there's faculty here, we can relate to other faculty. Um, how, how ready do you feel like you said you need some more time? Do you feel it's just that you have enough skills and by reading the information you'd be able to pick up? Or do you feel that you'd need additional training? All right, so uh, in terms of uh, reading the information, I believe uh, I'll be ready to pick up. Uh, because so far, I'd say I've uh, from I've understood uh, much from uh, the presentation, especially the one you sent uh, yesterday. Um, however, I think in terms of uh, research training in, from a university, I think basically the I think uh, the basics uh, of it were taught. However, not um, not in this broad uh, spectrum of, say, like chemistry, because uh, I'd say my, my, um, my background was more in biology, so barely was there, um, uh, should I say, an, an interlinking with um, chemistry. But uh, I, I think now with the explanation of the basic concepts for me, I think I found it much more easier, and I, I think, um, yeah, I, even though I said need more time, I think um, I think I'm ready. Yeah, in case of anything. Thank you. And that's a comment we hear often: is that uh, there needs to be more interdisciplinary training in the sciences across Kenyan universities uh, to mix different fields, and not only just the natural sciences, but the social sciences as well. So that's something that we'll try to show, demonstrate more as we move forward. Uh, Nancy, we move to you. If you're able to turn on your video, if not, let us know. You can just continue with audio. For the round table, what I'm thinking is we could we could get more into this discussion about um, looking at samples and looking at uh, electronic waste and, and then because next week we'll be doing building materials so we try and develop a discussion towards the importance we, we talk about uh, material recovery facilities and things like that 
and the importance of not limiting this type of analysis just to the electronics or to the building materials that looking at system effects. Um, so we'll give Nancy a chance to join and each of you a chance to think about a little. Okay, let's well, let's start the discussion, and then uh, when Nancy joins, we'll add her commentary. So I'll start with you, Enoch, and I'll mute myself in terms of. Okay, so Enoch, the first question for you is in terms of as you had presented green chemistry and green innovations, and we're now trying to limit system effects. Uh, what do you want uh, the audience to know about moving from green to sustainable practices in chemistry and this reduction of hazardous? We're, we're talking about electronics today. To, next week we'll be talking about building materials, so just some general guidelines that you would want uh, the audience and uh, especially industry to think about. Thank you. <clears throat> so now, um, a shift in chemistry from the normal is inevitable because of the change in the society the way it is. If we continue doing the things normally the way we are doing right now, in the next decade, I don't think that whether we shall be having <clears throat> the environment that we will be able to to be happy with it. Look at currently the trends in uh, in, in in diseases in the country. Um, diseases like cancer that we used not to hear in the last decade. This to twenty first first century we cancer is a common thing in our society. You get that each and every person here in this meeting, we ask them if you have interacted with someone who has cancer, or a family member, close family member with cancer. Get that everyone will say yes. Cancer is on increasing trend. And the cause of cancer most of the time is not known. But you can be able from research to see that this thing, the, 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 the pollutants that are causing cancer are this and this because of the increasing trend in certain regions. So this uh, increase, for example, if you look at the trend of cancer uh, that was reported just the other day, uh, uh, during the cancer day in cancer workshop, you will see the, the, the counties with large amount or a number of people affected with cancer. There's something that's telling us, this trend is telling us something. The pollution that we have caused in our environment is the major, major, major sources of these health problems that we have. So, one of the ways of changing in which the disease pattern in our community is to change on the ways that we are doing things. So one of the things that we need to change is innovation in which we are getting to greener chemistry from greener chemistry to sustainable chemistry where we are taking now the green innovation to the industrial scale that will be able to have profit and be able to be applied in that scale. So what I can be able to say is green chemistry is something that we as as chemists we need to innovate and take it to industrial scale 
and it's inevitable. So as CSPI, we are looking forward to where we have the innovation and this innovation being tested in that scale and being applied in different industries. Thank you, Enoch. Uh, Hezron Van Kennedy. Hezron, go ahead. I'll, I, I, he's just walked out. He's, he's on a, some urgent call. Let me just uh, continue from there. Yes, I, we look forward to also uh, trying to relate the global data to what actually happens at the uh, size of specific areas. Yes, it is important that we have the whole data set from the global perspective, but again, uh, uh, we have a case study where we are looking at some organochlorine pesticide contamination along the, the lake region there. And when we pick just some samples there from what the other things that we are looking at. Sorry, sorry to interrupt without seeing your video. Pardon the? Your video. Okay. I am saying that just from the output that we have been able to see, the sound, let me adjust, is it yes, okay now? I am saying that just from the output data that we have there, we, 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 we found some very interesting things that we were thinking of also applying to the local uh, perspective because just the other day, we were doing some, just a normal organochlorine pesticide residue analysis in either water and the soil sediments that we found along some regions around the Lake Victoria. But we cannot upscale it to compare with the global standard because we needed a, a that parameter that we, or that software that will now help us to have our, we are able to key in, have our own input, the data that we have, and then compare the output in terms of this is what the, the exposure level for these elements are required. Because from the way I look at it, we only picked the, there were only three that were picked. But what if we go beyond the mercury, lead, and uh, cadmium, and now look at also some of the pesticides? Because I saw from the introduction that was done by Enoch, you're also looking at the whole uh, sustainability issues and organochlorine pesticides are also part of it. So what I don't get clear, which I am really trying to learn what I also be able to do is, if we have our local data that we have done analysis of this, at what level are we able to have an input in uh, UTOX that we are also able to compare the local data that we have for that region specific to the global data that we have? My understanding is what you we can take the same parameters used. Uh, so if you use the, the 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 same analysis parameters, you can create an input spreadsheet and upload that into the use talks and then run comparative assessments. So uh, what you can do is uh, there's sort of input data in the in the zip file when you on on there's a folder that says inputs. You can create, use that same Excel template, and then gather that data. And then when, when you replace the file, instead of using the, the uh, there's that, that screen share we showed about how to select which database. So you'll change that database from the one that's provided by Use Talks to the one that you've created using by the local data and the, using the same parameters. Then when you run that through the software, it'll analyze then those 
parameters using the ones that you provided. And you can then do a comparison between like the the output that you just looked at right now, which you're you're analyzing, and then you rerun and you have the, out, the output using your localized parameters, and then you can do your comparative benchmarking. Oh, that, that, that would be interesting. I, I, uh, I want to try that. You're sounding in, sorry. Yes, I'm saying that would be very interesting. I would really like to try like that for who to hear. I can't hear you. Hello? Oh, your your image and sound froze. Uh, he dropped up. So while he's reconnecting Nancy, let's test your sound now. All right, maybe we capture your feedback in the chat. Okay. And then Kennedy, you were you were speaking and then we lost your sound and your video. You want to try again? Yes, I was, I was saying that it is something that we will be interested okay, we in can trying. Okay, no uh, but we can't hear you. It's not, it's okay now. Hello, is it, is it now okay? We still can't hear you. Imagine it's oh, hold on, let me see. Hold on one second. Try now. Can you now hear me? Yes. Okay. We, we were saying that it is something that we were, we will be so much interested in trying to just see also uh, if we compare the, the regional data with the global data that we have. And you had explained to me that uh, there is a, a, a data sheet that we can have an input and then we try and see if able to give us the same output and then analyze and do the comparison. Can you, you want to talk? Yeah. And we are, okay, just in a minute, uh, Dr. Ogunzi is also here joining us to make a contribution on what he was saying. Yeah, uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry for not being able to um, initially um, have, have, have a reaction. Now, um, um, one of the things that um, that I appreciate, particularly with with, with this uh, um, uh, this this um, uh, engagement, and particularly with the use talks um, um, system, is that as a comparative tool, where uh, various scientists contribute, um, and therefore as a scientist or as a researcher, I'm able to uh, input my data, have a comparative analysis. Um, um, that, that in itself is, is a very, very important to compare it. And finally, it's comparative. You're you're muted. Can you hear me? Yes, now we can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. If you can hear me, you can say, uh, raise your hand. Yes, we can hear you.
Okay, Nancy, try again. Can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, sorry for that technical hit. I was saying that I have learned one or two things from the presentations. And apart from the technical bit, I would just like to emphasize what Enoch spoke about. He talked about uh, empowering students in high schools to uptake science courses, that is chemistry and biology. That is very timely because we are living at a time when climate is varying and we need more youthful solutions that only our youth who are in high schools can come up with. And they can only do that if we empower them, if we encourage them, and if we build their capacity. Thank you. Thank you. And in terms of uh, the level of presentation, do you feel moving forward we need to simplify or should we keep it at the same level or? I think we can keep it at the same level depending on the audiences and the participants because knowledge is learned and it takes everyone's effort to learn one or two things from the different presentations. Okay. Thank you. I'll wait for um, Kennedy and Hezron to rejoin, hopefully. So I think one, one thing that's coming clear is the uh, excitement about collaborative chemistry, not just so working in teams, even though across different institutions, across different countries, but to be able to start looking at the data and uh, inputting and comparing results is one of the things that I'm hearing as a carry forward out of this. And that is uh, uh, a real uh, exciting uh, to hear uh, sort of the, the, the enthusiasm for moving in that direction because it is where the global community is in terms of data. And now we have a tool like Use Talks that we can use for those kinds of exchanges. Here they are. Uh, Kennedy and Hezron, you can go ahead. Yeah, we, we, are, we, are, we are sorry. Uh, we are having some difficulties with the uh, university um, network. And that's why we keep on going off. Um, We can hear you. We can't see you, but we can hear you. All right, so Hezron said their network has exceeded capacity with this uh, video, so uh, we'll wrap it up. And
Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for coming together. And uh, this is a great effort. And we'll do another one next week. And uh, now that we've had our first run, uh, we'll get better at it next week. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.